Week 17 is in the books. The fantasy football season is done. Hopefully you guys won some championships, but because we are sick degenerates, we are going to do a two round 2024 fantasy football mock draft. This is a redraft mock. We're not talking dynasty in this video and obviously huge caveat with any of this stuff. So much could change. This is just a fun exercise. We're trying to see who's going to be the top of the fantasy rankings next year. This could have some kind of dynasty implications when you're thinking about maybe guys you want to buy on the low for contenders or whatever. But for the most part, this is just a fun exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Again, before you guys go to the comments and be like, how could you not have this guy in your top two rounds? It's for fun. There's a lot that could happen this offseason, free agency, NFL draft. We're going off of what we know right now. And what we know right now is there's 24 damn good football players we'll be talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. So let's not waste any time. If you guys enjoy, leave a like. If you're new around here, leave a subscription down below. Dynasty season's getting into full swing. It's going to be a very, very fun offseason with the class that we have on deck. But let's hit the intro. All right, so if you skip the intro, what we're doing here is we're going to do a PPR mock draft for redraft fantasy football 2024. Way too early version, as we talked about in the intro. There's going to be some debate about these players. There's going to be things that change. We're trying to project forward and also kind of go with what we know at this point in time. But this is just a fun exercise, and this could get you kind of ahead of the curve in terms of competitive assets and redraft and that kind of thing um, for dynasty purposes as well. Let's get things kicked off with the 1-1. This is the last time I'm officially retiring the statement relating to Christian McCaffrey that I'm going to talk about his age. I'm going to talk about his touch count. I'm going to talk about his injury history. Christian McCaffrey is a future Hall of Famer. As you guys recall in that age and touch apex video, I talked about, you know, LaDainian Tomlinson and Adrian Peterson and some of those guys being outliers to that study. Christian McCaffrey has entered that territory Finishing as the RB1 this year, put him cement, put him in the hall. He's going to go there. One of the best dual threat running backs that we've seen in our lifetime. He is the 1-1 next year. Until I see him physically decline, until I see him deal with a bunch of injuries, until he's not on the best offense, the best offensive situation for him in the NFL, he will be the 1-1 for me in fantasy drafts. You will never have to hear me say, I'm not taking McCaffrey because of age and because of touches. I just simply won't say it pertaining to him. Yeah, and uh, you guys can get your laughs off in the comment section right now. Obviously, this is our biggest L of the fantasy football cycle this past year. We were staunchly against Christian McCaffrey. We were talking about in his legendary season how much pure touches that we got, and we were concerned that would those touches be available in this offense. Well, it doesn't matter if you're not getting 25 touches per game if you're scoring 21 touchdowns in 16 games. Christian McCaffrey's in the perfect offensive system, do it all running back, a lot of touchdowns, best team in the NFL, like, I understand the age and touch apex to a certain degree, but when you're dealing with Christian McCaffrey, if you miss out on him and he has another season like this, I wouldn't be able to look myself in the mirror. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that was a pretty easy one, one, at least as yeah. it stands for me, I think he should be the clear one, one next year. What are you looking at with the one, two here? Yeah, the one, two might shock a lot of people. Uh, well, not a lot of people if they had him in fantasy for that matter. Uh, I got to go with my boy, CD lamb. And I understand if you're looking at raw points that he did finish behind Tyreek Hill on the season, but you're you're uh, mixing in a couple things there. You're mixing in Tyreek's age. You're mixing mixing in that developing rapport that we've seen with CD Lamb down the stretch with Dak Prescott. Since week six, after the Cowboys bye week, in the first four or five weeks of the season, a lot of people were questioning, what is this version of the Cowboys offense? They got blown out against the Niners. They didn't really have a clear direction. Weren't playing with a lot of pace. It was honestly just a sluggish, you know, mediocre type of offense we were watching. That bye week happens, and they develop into arguably the best offense in the NFL. Dak Prescott putting in a near MVP level campaign. CeeDee Lamb being, in my opinion, down the stretch, the best wide receiver in the NFL. Second in receiving yards this year, 12 total touchdowns, over 100 rushing yards. And since week six, he is averaging over 27 PPR points per game, which clears a guy like Tyree Kill, which clears all the other wide receivers on the plane. I think Christian McCaffrey has to be the one, one because of what he does at running back legendary season and just how bad the running back landscape is for the most part. But man, CD lamb, I think he's got to be at the one, two at this point. And that's not just because of the colors he wears. Yeah. And I'll back you up here because obviously you're biased because he's a Dallas Cowboys fan or you're a Dallas Cowboys fan. Dude, the dude had six games of over 28 PPR points down the stretch last year. Like that is absurd production. His down games were 17 PPR points. Like this guy was the model of consistency. I think there's an argument to be made who would be wide receiver one next year. I personally would still go with Tyree kill because honestly, Tyree kill has kind of entered the CMC stratosphere for me is 
this guy might be one of the best deep threats that's ever played football. And until he physically slows down, until he's not the same player anymore, I am not saying that he's too old to be an elite fantasy asset. So he is my Great. pick here at 1-3. I'm going to go with Tyreek Hill. But either one of these receivers, I think, should be the one two in drafts. Again, we'll get more clarity on the running back status and like who's going to be potentially RB2. But for now, knowing that there's some uncertainty around B. John Robinson, Brees Hall, Jameer Gibbs, Kyron Williams, any one of the like RB2 candidates that you could point to, I'm just going to probably rattle off receivers at this point in the draft and then save that late first round area, mid first round area to start taking running backs. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Tyree Kill, very good consideration for one, two. Obviously, high octane offense, Mike McDaniel, the Dolphins, the way Tua Tungo Vailoa played this year. Uh, Tyree Kill, you can make the argument, was the most viable player in the NFL. Obviously, Lamar Jackson is going to probably win the award. I think he's minus 20,000 at this point to do so. But Tyree Kill, for any non quarterback, I think would be my leading vote getter. So, agree with you with Tyree Kill. This is where it starts getting interesting because this is a guy that I think may be on par talent wise with Tyree Kill, but we have a little bit less certainty with the quarterback situation. For the purpose of the exercise, I'm going to be assuming whether it's Kirk Cousins, whether it's another veteran whether it's uh just a capable quarterback they are in place for minnesota and with that being said i will take justin jefferson last year's 101 we obviously know elite potential um this guy arguably has a path to being one of the best receivers of all time in his first few seasons when he's been healthy he has been a guy averaging over 100 yards per game cracking that 9 10 11 touchdown area we just need the quarterback situation to be settled obviously he's going to drop if we see that going into next year they have like nick mullins as the starter or maybe a guy like a rookie quarterback as a starter but for the time being assuming no quarterback uncertainty justin jefferson i think has to be the one for yeah i mean we only got a four game sample size out of justin jefferson being healthy this year before yeah. he suffered that injury and then missed a bunch of time 24 ppr points 24.9 ppr points 27.9 and 26.5 literally averaging 25.8 ppr points per game I think Kirk Cousins will be back. Will he be ready for week one? Not exactly sure. Maybe they'll sign a Jacoby Brissett to bridge for like four or five games. That'd be perfect. Until Kirk Cousins is back. But even in that scenario, let's say Jacoby Brissett is his starter for the first four weeks of the season until Kirk Cousins comes back. This offense throws the ball like crazy. Even despite having a very improved defense this year, they still threw the ball all over the yard. And we were talking about entering the season. Like, could Justin Jefferson have 2,000 yards this year? Could Justin Jefferson have 200 targets this year? That is still in his range of outcomes. So yes, he absolutely belongs to be in consideration for as high as the 102 next year. Yeah, no, completely same page. Justin Jefferson, I honestly think he's going to go down as one of the top 10 wide receivers of all time. I really do. Yeah, for sure. So again, I'm staying on the wide receiver train because I do think there's some question marks at running back, even though I still like a lot of these guys. I'm going to roll with uh, Justin Jefferson's LSU teammate. I'm going to roll with uh, Jamar Chase. Uh, Chase has been kind of unlucky for the last like two seasons, right? This year, so much crap happened to the Cincinnati Bengals. Joe Burrow gets injured. Jamar Chase was dealing with some stuff. Um, the offense just couldn't click because they didn't have a lot of practice and training camp time together. But within the range of outcomes, and we got to remember this about Jamar Chase and the Bengals, is a you know 49ers level takeover of the Bengals offense versus the rest of the NFL. Joe Burrow's that good of a quarterback. Jamar Chase is that good of a wide receiver. We don't know what will happen with T. Higgins in the offseason. Maybe they'll replace him in the draft. Maybe they'll re-sign him. Maybe they'll franchise tag him. I don't exactly know, but what I do know is that you know, Jamar Chase has spike week potential like anybody I've ever seen. Like the guy can put up 60 point weeks in fantasy football. Only really Tyree Kill has shown the capability of doing that. So even though he's like the most inconsistent of this group, you're getting a higher floor on a given week with Lamb, with Jefferson, and with Tyreek. Chase just has the ability to have a legendary season. And that's what I want out of a, a top wide receiver pick. So even though he's a little bit more volatile, I'm still willing to take the, the plunge on Jamar Chase as high as 103, 104, 105 here. Yeah, and sometimes people you'll hear kind of vary away from variance for the most part. They're like, oh, I don't like that type of player. The way I kind of evaluate it is, you know, at the top of your drafts, Christian McCaffrey, C.D. Lamb, Tyree Kill, Justin Jefferson, they have the elite potential just to just flat out win the league on their own. With Jamar Chase, he is one of the very few players, I think, in fantasy football period that has that level of upside. So although you might be worried about the availability, again, the last couple of years, missed a game this year, missed a few games uh, two years ago. Obviously, that rookie season was arguably one of the best rookie seasons of all time, but that's the volatility mixed in. But the ceiling is still worth taking that swing on. Even if you are a little bit nervous, he may miss a game or two because of the injury history. Don't be. You have to have that ceiling in order to compete for the championship. Yeah, and how many times have we like taken the full scope of the season? And this is why we do things like the contextualized game log series in the summer. Yep. 
and we look at, okay, when healthy Jamar Chase was on the field and Joe Burrow was playing at a high level, what did they actually produce? There was only a minimal stretch of games. It was like week four to like week eight or whatever before um, Joe, Joe Burrow decided to get injured there. And Jamar Chase looked exactly like the guy that you drafted probably at the 102, 103 in, um, in your drafts this year. So with Jamar Chase, again, take that like recency bias out of the picture. He's been hurt the last couple of years. Joe Burrow was hurt this past year. He might go way lower than this in a lot of people's drafts. Like yeah. 105 might be really high relative to where a lot of people might take him. You might be able to get him at, you know, the 108 to 111 range in your drafts this year. And I think this could be the type of dude that absolutely breaks fantasy because there's a reason we were taking him at 102 last year. We were taking him at 102 because he had like 99% of Justin Jefferson's upside. And that's why we were taking him that high. And he still has that upside. The Bengals could do what the Dolphins looked like for the first 12 weeks of this season. They could do what the 49ers have looked like for the most part this season or what the Cowboys, like you said, after the bye have been doing. It's just they're annihilating teams. And Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase would be the catalyst for that. Um, So that's why he's my pick there at 105. Yeah, 100%. I'm glad you mentioned the contextualized game logs because if we're looking at the period of week three to week uh, 10, I believe, uh, before Joe Burrow obviously got hurt against the Ravens in week 11, like you're looking like a pretty freaking sustained level of upside here. 26.1 PPR points in a game, 52.2, a little weak weak winning level week, 25.2, 23.4. He has the upside of some of those other guys. And assuming Joe Burrow comes back fully healthy from that injury, I think he has to be considered amongst that group. So I agree with you there. Love what Jamar Chase brings to the table. My next pick at the 106 here is going to be another guy that Late touchdown might have put you in a good position for your fantasy football championship. Was able to watch him on Saturday Night Football. I love what I'm seeing from Amon or St. Brown. He is the catalyst. He is the focal point of one of the best offenses in the NFL. Obviously, it's yet to be seen what this could potentially look like with Ben Johnson potentially being a head coach at another spot. But at the same time, Amon or St. Brown is a target monster. Jared Goff is a top 15 level quarterback. And even if they lose Ben Johnson, I do still think this is a top 10 level offense in the league. Amon or St. Brown, like I said, you can look at 10 targets per game. You can look at over 20 PPR points per game. And since realistically his bye week this year, he was a guy averaging 21.2 PPR points per game. He was one of the guys where if you had him in your best ball league, he was one of the top eight highest advanced players for a reason. That level of consistency, that level of upside we see in relation to other wide receivers that may not have that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only concern, like you just said, is is that do they lose Ben Johnson? Because Jared Goff's going to be back next year, we I'd imagine, his contract and, and such. Um, the whole offense is not going to really change. The difference could be that, you know, Ben Johnson is the type of guy that that was the leader of this offense. And we've kind of seen that from the Eagles this year. And we're like, uh, you know, um, Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, like the offense doesn't quite look the same without Shane Steichen. That could be the case next year with the uh, um, Detroit Lions offense. Hopefully Ben Johnson just stays for a Monroe St. Brown's case, but I want selfishly Ben Johnson to go to Carolina or something and try and fix Bryce Young. So um, that will be an interesting case study with a Monroe, but more or less you're getting a, a hitting a double in the first round type of pick. Like, you, you know what you're getting out of him. Going to be 170, 180 target upside type of dude. PPR stud, exactly what you're looking for. I'm actually going to stay on the same team with my next pick. So I'm going to go with Jameer wow. Gibbs. Um, as the first or second running back off the board after Christian McCaffrey, the reason I'm going with Gibbs as the RB two, because there's an argument to be made for a lot of guys, Kyron Williams, who was the RB two this year in points per game over 21 PPR points per game. Absolutely absurd from a second year, fifth round rookie, um, two years ago. Um, B. John Robinson, obviously top 10 pick in this year's draft. Arthur Smith kind of ruined him this year. Still has all the upside in the world. Brees Hall been very productive even without Aaron Rodgers this year. You could make the argument, hey, he was what, the RB5, RB6 in points per game this year on one year removed from an ACL tear and no Aaron Rodgers. Imagine what he could do next year. That is definitely a, a reasonable case. But the reason I think Jameer Gibbs is the easiest projection now is basically everything you said about St. Brown. We know what we're getting out of this offense. Second year running backs traditionally take a step forward. Jameer Gibbs took a couple of weeks to get acclimated to the NFL, get his workload. But once he took hold of it, he never let it go. And I really did think that the Lions coaching staff might have been stubborn enough to keep David Montgomery as the lead back, even though Jameer Gibbs was the better guy. And that's not what happened at all. Jameer Gibbs took over this job. He was unbelievably productive down the stretch. How many points does Jameer Gibbs have to score to be considered the RB2 in next year's class? Ryan Heath of Fantasy Points did the study on, you know, when running backs typically have their legendary seasons, when running backs typically take that next step forward in a workload. It's almost always first, second, and third years. And Jameer yep. Gibbs going into his second season, especially from, you know, week four on or week six on when we saw him take over the job, he could have monster upside this year. Again, 
look back and think about the second year running backs this year, Rashad White, Kyron Williams, Isaiah Pacheco, all these guys taking big steps forward in their workloads. Now copy and paste that to the guy that was a 12th pick in the draft. Not to mention a guy that since week seven this year, keep in mind, we're only talking about 62% of the snaps, 47% of the rushing attempts and 62% of the routes. Average 19.6 PPR points per game down the stretch. He was doing what he was doing, a league-winning level running back, on only 62% of the snaps. Now you're entering week two, like uh, year two, like you said. Now you're entering a full offseason with the team. Now you're entering that conversation where he, he's, he's on the same page with Jared Goff. He's on the same page with the offense. Dan Campbell trusts him in more situations. Let's say that 62% snap share goes up to 70%. That rushing share goes up to 55%. That row participation goes up to 70, 75%. That 19.6 PPR points per game is going to be laughed at. We could be looking at a guy that has 22, 23 PPR points per game and looks like the next Alvin Kamara, which is funny enough, Dan Campbell's last stop. I was, I'm so glad you brought Kamara up because I was literally going to look at Alvin Kamara's PPR points per game, his rookie season. It's literally 19.6. I'm not even shitting <laughs> you. That's how many PPR points per game he had his rookie season. Care to guess what his, tw his second year was in points per game? 22.7. 23.6. PPR points per game, his second season. So again, like we've been gifted Alvin Kamara 2.0 and I'm just going to ride the way with him. And again, if you wanted to take him as high as 103, 104, I don't think Agreed. that's outrageous. And as it stands right now, he would be the guy that I would pick as RB2. Hurts me to say that as a Bijan truther and a guy that absolutely loves Bijan. I still love Bijan again, but Jameer Gibbs, he just has to be higher than him in, in redraft next year. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And I'm between two guys for this next pick at the 108. Um, you went with the running back, so let me uh, just get some more conversation on a running back, a guy that I think is entering a new situation next year with his potential starting quarterback back. We got Brees Hall, and if you were able to advance Brees Hall in your best ball leagues last two weeks of the year, he might have just won you at all. Like Realistically, Brees Hall down the stretch, if you were to make it to the semifinal, to the final of your league, we saw the level of upside that he has, both from a receiving standpoint, from a juice standpoint in the running game. You're dealing with an awful offensive line. You're dealing with an awful offensive situation. Team multiple times projected for applied points under 17 points. And yet, Brees Hall was still able to show the level of talent to be able to break that situation. It really reminds me of a young Saquon Barkley, the juice that he has, the receiving ability, man. Brees Hall is phenomenal player. And with Aaron Rodgers coming back with a potential high pick to add to the offensive line, I really love the post-hype upside of this Jets offense. And trust me, this is not the first Jet you will see on this video because, I mean, if Aaron Rodgers is healthy, I think they are one of the best six or so teams in the AFC, which maybe wasn't evident this year with how bad the offense was. With Aaron Rodgers, you're getting a top 10 quarterback. You're getting Garrett Wilson on the outside, taking some pressure off the running game. And you're getting Brees Hall, the opportunity to score 65-yard touchdowns every single week. Yeah, I want to see the Jets definitely make some improvements on their offense sure. as a whole. Because as great as Garrett Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, and Brees Hall are, you need some ancillary weapons. You need some protection, as we talked about. If they have the seventh pick in the draft or whatever, you need to add a Joe Alt to this team or whatever. Um, so yeah, Brees, I mean, let me just give you guys some context. Brees Hall... Since Robert Sala made the comment, the training wheels are off. That happened before week five. That's when he made that comment. He averaged 19.3 PPR points per game in one of the worst situations you could possibly be in. He had Zach Wilson, Tim Boyle, and Trevor Simeon as his quarterback. And he averaged nearly 20 points per game. And he also had games where he still wasn't getting a full workload. He was still only getting, you know, 55, 60% of the snaps. By the end of the season, this guy was getting everything, everything under the sun, all the routes, all the targets, all the touches, and it resulted in 43.1 points per game in week 16 and 27.6 points in week 17. Imagine what this guy can do with Aaron Rodgers. It's a very easy projection. Again, remember, this guy was also second year off of his ACL tear, dude. Yeah. Like We don't see running backs produce, period, let alone a top five season, a top four points per game season. That's what he was, RB4, after the, Sala made those comments. So fun fact, obviously, you know, you can't just copy and paste the numbers here, but since the bye week for the Jets, obviously with Aaron Rodgers, you're not expecting as many check downs. You're expecting more explosive plays, but I also think that increases his scoring potential. He scored six total touchdowns in that stretch. Healthy Rodgers, I think you could probably expect eight to 10, but his target numbers are really, really interesting, man. Nine targets, four targets, three targets, six, nine, eight, nine, 16, nine. Like you're talking about a do it all three down running back and what could potentially be a top five to 10 offense. I understand it's a little bit more projection than some of these other first round players, but 
I'm playing to win it's my not, league. And it's, it's not, honestly, dude. If you have a top five season with Zach Wilson, Tim Boyle, Trevor Simeon, the worst offensive line I've ever seen, th- you can do it with Aaron Rodgers and even yeah. a, a, an equal offensive line and play calling. Like, if nothing else changed, just Aaron Rodgers, he then has more upside to be the top running back in fantasy. Agreed. Yeah, no, I agree. So uh, we can move on to the next pick, the 109. What direction are you leaning here? You're keeping this running back train going, or are you going back to the wide receiver well? I feel like it's disrespectful if I don't pick Puka Nakua here. So I'm going to go with Puka Nakua over AJ Brown as well. The reason I'm going with Puka Nakua is, I mean, what can I say about this dude's rookie season, man? The guy (laughs) literally is going to break the receiving record as a fifth round pick. And Cooper Cup, going to be another year older. But the rest of the situation should stay the same. Assuming that Sean McVay is not going to retire, which we've heard rumors about. Assuming that Matthew Stafford is still going to be there. Um, Puka Nakua has as much upside as, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown and, you know, some of these other guys that we're taking here. So, yeah, I don't think it needs to be said much more. Like, if we don't have Puka Nakua inside the top 10 picks, like, what does this guy have to do to be a top 10 pick in next year's class or in next year's fantasy drafts? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, the the touchdown totals were a little bit low, but for a rookie season, having over 1450 receiving yards with the game and counting, like there's a reasonable chance with the 40, uh, with the Rams playoff seating on the line, still something to play for. Like Puka could have a 1600 yard rookie receiving ce- uh, ceiling. And when Justin Jefferson did it, when Jamar Chase did it, we were quick to prop them up into our top fives. Now, Number nine is still baking in. Okay, maybe Cooper Cup is still a healthy guy and maybe he's more healthy going to next year. But even if he is, I trust Sean McVay. I trust Matthew Stafford. We have seen multiple times in the past, no matter who it is on the outside, Matthew Stafford gets fantasy relevance from his receiver. Not to mention, I mean, Puka Nakua, he is in the perfect spot to do what his strengths would indicate. Sean McVay is a brilliant coach. Like I said, Matthew Stafford's a brilliant quarterback. And if Kyron Williams, who we'll get into in a second, is running the way he has been this year, I think this has to be a top five offense going into next year. So I really love the pick. Puka Nakua, like, I, uh, like you said, I agree, has to be a clear-cut first-round pick. You mentioned the name A.J. Brown. That's the direction I'm going to lean this uh, here. Obviously, a lot of turmoil down the stretch. If you had A.J. Brown, not a strong finish given, you know, inconsistencies with the offense, given, you know, inconsistencies with that connection with Jalen Hurts. But what we have seen is him absolutely take over some weeks. Third in the NFL and receiving, still tied to, uh, tied to what I expect to be a much improved offense moving to next year. This is still the same offense we thought would be top five going into this year. So maybe a little bit more clarity from the top, from a play calling perspective. Maybe they move on from Brian Johnson. Some a little bit uh, unknown narratives that could be happening this offseason. But regardless, A.J. Brown is a top five NFL talent at wide receiver attached to Jalen Hurts and still has the opportunity to score 10 plus touchdowns. I don't think he can leave the first round. Yeah, no, I agree with you. He's got to be at some point on this thing. He is a much better real life receiver than he is in fantasy. I mean, 18 PPR points per game is a great season, but you know, Puka Nakua has a higher ceiling for fantasy, not as a real life receiver. Probably. I think A.J. Brown's a better real life receiver, but we are drafting fantasy production. And speaking of Puka Nakua's rookie season, Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase had monster rookie seasons. They did not have Cooper Cup on the field for their rookie seasons. Like, that is pretty yeah. insane to outduel a guy that was a legend, has literally the best fantasy wide receiver season in history. He literally outdueled that guy as a fifth round rookie. So, yeah, Puka Nakua has got to be up there. I'm staying on the Rams and I'm going with Kyron Williams with my next Love pick it. here. Love it. I did I ever expect to say the sentence that I would take Kyron Williams over B. John Robinson in fantasy football next year? Not a fucking chance. No way did I think this was possible. But at the same time, I'm projecting that he will be the starting running back of this team for a couple of reasons. Number one, Sean McVay is pretty loyal to his starting running back. We saw what he did for uh, Todd Gurley. When he liked Cam Akers, he was pretty loyal to him. But obviously, Akers and him had kind of some weird relationship. Kyron Williams doesn't have this huge threat of competition coming in. It's not the James Robinson situation. It's not the um, Tyler Algier situation. There is no Travis Etienne or Bijan Robinson in this year's draft class. Maybe they go out and sign somebody in free agency, but why would you do that? You have a guy on a rookie contract and he's going to be um, pretty solid for you. So assuming Kyron Williams is the starting running back of this team, only Christian McCaffrey was better in a points per game uh, standpoint. Like you said, this offense with Puka next year, with Kyron Williams next year, Cooper Cup's still around, Matthew Stafford's still around. This is a great offense, one of the best in the league. So this is my biggest L of the entire season. I was low on this offense in general. It was good to be low on Cooper Cup because, you know, relative to where he was being drafted, he wasn't really that great of a pick and he was injured and all that kind of stuff. But what I should have been 
doing potentially was hedging that bet by drafting a lot of Puka Nakua and Kyron Williams. Cause I wasn't high on Cam Akers either. So it, it's kind of stupid that I didn't hedge this yeah. offense a little bit more. My thought process was that they just weren't going to be that good of a team. I didn't think they were going to be this good of an offense and this good of a team because Stafford was injured and McVay kind of seemed like he was half out of it. But I mean, Stafford's a potential future hall of fame quarterback. And yeah, um, Sean McVay has done borderline hall of fame caliber coaching this um, tenure so far. So, I mean, I probably just should have had more faith in the situation. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at Kyron's Will, uh, Williams season, I mean, it's pretty remarkable how a couple of years ago we were talking about this slow, small running back out of Notre Dame that all the film bros loved, but the analytics just did not align. I mean, this is an outlier, man. He's a stud. Over five yards per carry, 15 touchdowns scored in 12 games, finishes the RB5 despite missing those four games. Again, we're talking about a guy that was averaging over 20 PPR points per game as a second-year player. That typically doesn't happen. I mean, you mentioned right off the bat, you usually see that type of profile from more highly acclaimed type of running backs entering their year two, entering their year three, guys that go on day two, guys that go on day one. You typically don't see a guy coming out of what, round five, round six, when he was drafted uh, out of Notre Dame, just doing what he was able to do. Not to mention, I mean, the efficiency is really confusing to me because this was a guy in his rookie season that even when he got on the field, didn't look like this great player. Then all of a sudden, gets trusted with that workload over 20 touches per game and develops that type of ceiling that I didn't think was evident coming to the year. So I'll agree. This was an L for me. I should have been more on Kyron. I should have been taking him at the tail end of my drafts, knowing how staunch I was against Cam Akers. So just kind of got to hold it on the chin here. Uh, Kyron Williams has to be a first round pick going into next year. Yeah. So I, I missed me in the comment section. Some people are going to be like, Oh, he's 195 pounds. They're going to draft Travion Henderson. It's like, until that happens, I'm like, I'm not going to go there with Kyron yeah. Williams. And from a dynasty perspective, like how high does this guy rank? Top eight, top 10 in dynasty. He's got to be that Easily. high. Like you can't, I, I get it. Draft off. capital is a concern and you know, we don't know how long he's getting, but you dude, you tell me you get two more years of production, even 80% of what he put up this year. He's a top five to seven dynasty running back. So, um, one eleven's a pretty good spot for him here. And again, he might even end up higher than this. Yeah, he definitely could be. So, uh, I will be at the one twelve here and. I mentioned Christian McCaffrey may be our biggest L of uh, the entire offseason. Well, uh, another one that we had that didn't really work out too well for us is going to be B. John Robinson. And I think this solely has to do with coaching, to be honest. Like the number of times I'm seeing Tyler Algier on the field, the number of times I'm seeing Cordero Patterson getting goal line snaps. Like going to the next year without Arthur Smith, I don't expect that to be an issue. I still think we're getting that generational running back prospect that we saw, that three down workload that we saw in college. I still think we're getting that going into next season. Quarterback play is going to be the question here. Is it going to be Desmond Ritter? Is it going to be Taylor Heineke? I think it's going to be neither, whether it's they trade for a guy like Justin Fields, they sign a guy like Kirk Cousins, or just flat out take a guy like Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, or Michael Penix, or J.J. McCarthy in the draft. I think new quarterback play will be inserted into this offense. And realistically, man, give me top 20 level quarterback play on this offense, and I think it's going to be one of the top 10 offenses in the league. I think this is a really good spot for if Ben Johnson wanted to come over, if one of those highly acclaimed offensive minds wanted to come over, they have a lot of pieces to play with. Kyle Pitts on the uh, at tight end, Drake London on the outside, good offensive line, but I do still, still think the central point of this offense, the focal point of this offense, revolves around number seven. Bijan Robinson, obviously, we expected it to be a legendary season right off the bat. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. We're going to take the L this year, but I do think going into next year, he still has that same ceiling I envisioned for him entering this year. Yeah, I think betting on him over Christian McCaffrey was wrong process, but betting on him to have a legendary season is something I would have done every single day of the week. Yeah. Like drafting him at the late first round area that he was going and, and being like, dude, this guy could have a 25 point per game season. And it wouldn't shock me. I'm going to bet on that profile any day of the week. Maybe we 100%. should have been taking him over CMC. I'll give you that, but... At the same time, this dude still was an RB1 in half of his games. Like, he was still yeah. pretty good relative to the situation. A 17% target share for a rookie running back is also very good. So, if the coaching figures itself out, and I think if the Falcons lose this week, then Smith will be gone, then we're looking at a pretty good situation next year. Hopefully, they can figure out the quarterback spot. Hopefully, you know, offensive mind that comes in will know how to use Bijan Robinson pro uh, uh, properly, but... Again, I would have said Arthur Smith was a positive heading into this year, at least for Bijan's sake. Maybe not for London and Pitts and stuff, but um, yeah, it, he's a challenging evaluation. And this is where I would put him as of right now as well. Late first round, early second round area. Um, let's try and speed through the second round a little Agreed. bit faster because we're going a little long on this video so far. Uh, I'm going to go, who do I want to go with with this next pick? I'm going to stay at the running back position. I'm going to go with Travis Etienne at the 2-1. Um, Travis Etienne 
kind of also had like a semi Brees Hall like season. Obviously, his quarterback play wasn't near as bad as Brees Hall's, but Trevor Lawrence didn't take the step that I thought he was going to. And I still think, similar to what I said with Jamar Chase, in the range of outcomes, is this Jacksonville Jaguars offense actually dominating the NFL? I think Trevor Lawrence has that type of a ceiling as a quarterback. And Travis Etienne finished as what, like the RB4 in points per game this year, like our RB6 in points per game. Let me actually look up exactly where he finished. He was RB6 in points per game this year on an offense that couldn't really get things going, was inconsistent week over week. They should be better next year, or at least there's the upside that they're better next year. And ETN took a lot of steps forward, got more receiving work this year. We saw in that week 17 game, his ability to break off long runs. That was the longest run of his career. Um, and he was banged up kind of middle of the season. But prior to him getting banged up, I mean, he was a guy that you were absolutely happy with that draft pick. For the first eight to 10 games of the year, he was second only to Christian McCaffrey in fantasy points. Yeah, I mean, a little high for me personally because uh, he didn't have the level of efficiency I wanted to see this year. But like you kind of said, that's also attributed to just how bad the offensive situation was. Trevor Lawrence playing her offensive line, not playing well throughout the majority of the year. I mean, this is still a team that started 8-3 and three before that skid that ultimately got them in the position that they are. I do think banking on a healthy Trevor Lawrence, maybe Calvin really does take that next step next year, second year in the offense. A little bit disappointing in relation to what we expected coming into the year. This offense has a way higher ceiling than what they showcased this year. I do still believe they have to add some offensive line help because their offensive line was a train wreck. But regardless, Travis, Travis Etienne, touchdown score, three down back, a lot of targets. Like this is the type of profile you're going to be betting on for a bounce back every single year. And not to mention, it's not like he's bouncing back since he was still a really good fantasy running back this year. It's more so just if he gets back to the 4.5, 4.7 yards per carry on top of what he's doing, you're talking about a top three ceiling rather than the RB6. Yeah, 20 and a half PPR points per game weeks one to eight when the offense was playing better, yep. the offensive line was playing a little bit better. Again, I want to bet on offenses that have the upside to have a Miami Dolphins-like season or have a uh, San Francisco 49ers-like season. And maybe the Jags don't have quite that level of offense uh, of upside, but if Trevor Lawrence takes a step forward that I think he should eventually take at, at some point in his career, maybe it was derailed by injuries this year, um, I'm still quite excited about Travis Etienne's outlook. So uh, what are you rolling with here? Yeah, uh, my next bet, I talked about how uh, Brees Hall wouldn't be the only Jet on this video, and I'm going right back to the well with Garrett Wilson. Now, obviously, we didn't really get to see him take that sophomore set, uh, step because his quarterback got hurt in the first game of the season. Aaron Rodgers tears his Achilles, and ultimately, that really costed the ceiling what we could have expected from Garrett Wilson. We were able to see this guy command targets at an elite level, over 10 targets per game, 163 targets in the 16 games he played. That is the level of alpha we're dealing with. We're dealing with a true end, number one wide receiver, entering that year three where we usually see breakout candidates happen. I mean, he's kind of got a similar profile to that of CeeDee Lamb, where after the rookie season, we were really excited. Second year, maybe a little bit disappointing in terms of uh, relation to his expectation. Year three was the year with the quarterback play of Dak Prescott. We saw CeeDee Lamb take that step. I think that's the case for Garrett Wilson. Again, this is assuming that Aaron Rodgers is ready to go. Again, full like we were hearing this guy potentially being ready to come back to the tail end of this year. I'm assuming by week one next year, if that was the case, he'll probably be healthy going into next year. And if that's the case, like I said, Aaron Rodgers still a top five to 10 quarterback in the league, Garrett Wilson, 10 targets per game. I think we're looking at the next 1,300, 1,400 yard, eight plus touchdown receiver, assuming Aaron Rodgers is even 80% of what we saw pre injury. Yeah, there's a lot of upside with Garrett Wilson. It's um, I don't even really have anything else to add. So um, <laughs> we can move on to the uh, next guy here. This one's a little bit of a challenging risk. I kind of took one already with Travis Etienne. I'm going to go with Jonathan Taylor here because I think Jonathan Ooh. Taylor, again, tough season, banged up, quarterback gets injured. Not a lot goes right. Again, when we do these fantasy drafts, we're not playing you know, the median range of outcomes. We're not playing the oh, what if like this goes wrong in their season? What if that goes wrong in their season? Because football is chaos, man. Like shit happens. Crazy players get injured. Crazy players go off, whatever. Jonathan Taylor, if Anthony Richardson can take a step forward next year, and we didn't really get a huge sample size of like what he can be as a quarterback, but what we did get out of him was the ability to affect the game with his legs. And if he is going to do that next year in his second NFL season, maybe this was low-key a good thing for him. He gets to sit back, watch Gardner Minshew after getting a taste of the NFL action. Jonathan Taylor wasn't on the field for any of those games, man. Like we had Zach Moss performing at a high level with those, uh, with those games with Anthony Richardson. So I think it's been bad luck for Jonathan Taylor. It's a little annoying. Maybe you're thinking, oh, he's injury prone. I'm not taking him this high, but 
running backs are injury prone until they're not. Jonathan Taylor only is like 25 years old. He's not some old washed up running back. He's still very talented. He still has a 20 plus points per game season under his belt. And him staying healthy, Anthony Richardson staying healthy, what we saw out of, in my opinion, the coach of the year in Shane Steichen this year, yeah. I'm excited about this offense and I'm excited about what Jonathan Taylor can be. And if this offense is a top 10 unit, like Jonathan Taylor has a chance to have a legendary season still. Yeah, no, it, it's really funny. Cause I mean, Jonathan Taylor uh, coming off of his season two years ago. So obviously he had the RB one season two years ago, a little bit disappointing gets hurt, gets banged up. We expect, you know, Oh, full year healthy Anthony Richardson taking the pressure off. That's why we were selecting him in the second round prior to that four game absence. He had to start the season. He was going there for a reason. Now we have even more confirmation that Anthony Richardson is indeed that guy. This isn't just a projection of the quarterback. This is, oh, when he was healthy, he was legitimately leading this offense into very successful situations. We know that for the factor of Anthony Richardson. We ultimately know now that, like you said, Shane Steichen is one of the best coaches in the league, best offensive line, uh, minds in the league. And we were able to see the type of running game he was able to conjure up in Philadelphia. Now you're getting a true bell cow running back entering the uh, ear healthy again, miss some games as a contract, a which is also something that we're getting annoyed with running backs every year and they paid him and they're committed to him. Yeah, no, 100%. All the factors leading up to Jonathan Taylor kind of having that post hype sleeper bounce back year. I really do think is the case now a little bit high for me. I think he's more of a mid second round pick for me, but that's simply because I think I have to take these next two quarterbacks before I take Jonathan Taylor. The first one, my quarterback one, the one I am taking here at the two, four, has got to be the main man himself, Josh Allen. I mean, he is just an absolute freak of nature. 42 combined touchdowns this year. We were able to see the Buffalo Bills adapt their own version of the tush push, which is what we're going to talk about with the other quarterback being so valuable is that once they get inside the one yard line, he is handling the touches there. But Josh Allen, I mean, we've seen the Bills adapt that variation. We're still getting a higher passing ceiling, in my opinion, than the other quarterback that we're going to mention in this video. Josh Allen's just the do-it-all howitzer. He's doing it with his arm. He's doing it with his legs. And he's also, like I said, one of the most accurate real-life passers in the league. I really do think this is my quarterback, too, uh, in the NFL period. So getting him here as a quarterback one in fantasy, knowing what he could do with his legs, I'm all for yeah, um, I'll keep things easy. I'll just roll with uh, Jalen Hurts with the next pick because, I mean, those two guys let out the quarterback position pretty comfortably. 24.1 yep. points per game for Allen, 23.1 for Hurts. Do it all threat. Tush push is unbelievable. Maybe they outlaw it. Maybe they don't. But I think people that are tweeting stuff like, oh, if they get rid of the tush push, like Jalen Hurts is neutered. They're for still going to run like, quarterback sneaks. Oh, run, run QB sneak and quarterback draw. They ain't banning that shit. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't get that argument, to be honest. I think Jalen Hurts and, and Allen are in a tier by themselves, and both of them put up a 23-plus point-per-game season this year, and honestly, still meat left on the bone for both guys. Allen turned the yeah. ball over a ton this year. Um, his receivers were banged up. Some of them you know, didn't perform. Diggs had a down stretch. Jalen Hurts, the offense didn't quite look the same this year. They might address that. Still meat left on the bone for these two guys. So um, very easy set it and forget it. Manage league starters, and of course, in best ball, we know what their ceilings are. Yeah, 100% agree. I think they have to go because I do think that uh, there's a little bit of tear break in terms of the flex players now. A lot of guys that I think would be in the mid-second to early uh, early to mid-third range for me that I kind of view similarly, whereas guys like, you know, Puka, Kyron, Etienne, you know, et cetera, Garrett Wilson, I do think are a little bit ahead. But transitioning now, uh, like I said, tear break, I'm going to take DJ Moore, wide receiver of the Chicago Bears. And this was the true breakout year of DJ Moore. How many years in a row did we say, Get this guy competent quarterback play. He's got a top 10 ceiling. Get this guy competent quarterback play. He's got a top 10 ceiling. Well, Justin Fields as a passer is probably at best an average quarterback play. And we're able to see this guy have 1,300 yards and eight touchdowns. Now we're entering the offseason where if they stick with Justin Fields, we've seen this evidence ceiling when DJ Moore's been healthy with Justin Fields. And then the other alternative is that they have Caleb Williams or Drake May throwing this guy the ball all season. Like, there's really no downside here to DJ Moore. He's shown he's an elite playmaker with the ball in his hands. He's shown he's an elite separator uh, in terms of winning on the outside. I mean, there's virtually no flaws to this guy's game. And I'm just glad we're able to see him fully healthy on display, have that level of ceiling. Because, again, we were looking at this guy for the longest time, 1,100 yards, four touchdowns. What's his actual ceiling? We're able to see it this year. Yeah, th this this like tier now kind of becomes a lot more muddy. Because yep. I think there's a ton of receivers that would blend together. I mean, we haven't mentioned Stefan Diggs yet. I think that's who I'm going to go with with my 2-7 just to make yep. things easy. I 
I don't know what to do with him, man. Like he, he was so good at the beginning of the year. Is he getting older? Is he getting washed up? I mean, the projection, if we assume he's the same Stefan Diggs, he's always been suggests that he should be going way higher than this, right? Like he should be going in the first round sometime. So for me with Stefan Diggs, again, a lot could change. We have no idea what could happen. I would love to see the bills add a running mate in the NFL draft. If the Bills, let's say, you know, finish with the 26th pick or the 28th pick or whatever, and they can add uh, Adonai Mitchell or Xavier Worthy or somebody like that to go along with Stefan Diggs, I think that would go a long way. I'm hoping Diggs stays in Buffalo and I'm hoping everything goes the same. I think everything will. Um, yeah. But at the same time, like, I, I, he's kind of just uncertain right now. And I 100% still would take him over DJ Moore. So we kind of differ on really, that one. Yeah. But I, I, I'm glad you've given DJ Moore some respect because literally oh, yeah. anytime Justin Fields has been on the on the field healthy, he's been like a 20 point per game receiver. Yeah, 100. I, I I love DJ Moore. I'm going with a little bit of youth there, a little bit of concern about what we saw from the from the uh, Bills offense on the stretch with Joe Brady as the caller. A little bit more concern baked in uh, there, in my opinion, for Stephon Diggs on top of being an older receiver than I do after DJ Moore. But I think, like you said, you can definitely make that argument. Next guy I'm going to go with, and this is assuming no running mate gets added to the backfield. Offensive situation is relatively similar. I got to give your boy some love, man. I was dead wrong with what I thought about Rashad White coming into the year, and I just completely spelled, misspelled his name. But um, Rashad White, man, down the stretch, you're looking at an every week top five overall running back. Much more efficient on the ground, elite targets, was scoring some touchdowns. Now we're potentially getting an offseason where the Bucks' offense can improve, whether it's that they go with Baker Mayfield for another year, they add to the offensive line, or downright maybe one of the better quarterbacks in the draft fall to them. A lot of uncertainty, but not a lot of factors, I think, that would diminish Rashad White's value. Again, I don't think you guys are going to add a running back. Obviously, we could change this if you guys end up doing so in the offseason cycle. But for the time being, with Rashad White having this backfield to himself, you're looking at a every down work, workhorse, elite receiving work, 20 touch per game back. You don't get many of those in the NFL. Yeah, I, I think so. You know how in like the early 2000s and 2010s, it was like, the workhorse running back. That's what we wanted. They were like plentiful, right? Like teams would pay them, teams would draft them highly, and they would give them all the work. We've almost like gone back to the workhorse running back, only now it's like these mid-round running backs that you get <laughs> on a cheap rookie deal. You use them up for two to three years, and then you let them go to the Wolves in free agency, and then you rinse and repeat. And I think the Bucks understand that, and I think the Rams understand that. So I don't think that Kyron Williams and Rashad White are just like, hey, they're going to add a running back to their backfield, and it's going to nuke their fantasy value. Like, honestly, I think the teams are smarter than that, and they're just going to be like, we're just going to use these guys up until they hit free agency. So Rashad White, from a redraft standpoint, yeah, he's got to be up there, uh, potentially even higher than we have him listed right now at 2.8. So definitely don't mind that pick. Again, a lot of different directions you could go. You could go with another running back that I just kind of mentioned in that vein with the James Cook type. Um, for the Buffalo Bills, you could maybe go back to one of the like sturdy, trusty veterans, a uh, Keenan Allen, um, Austin Eckler, maybe probably not that high Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs. If those guys stay with their current teams would probably be in the mix for this pick. The direction I'm going to go in with, with uh, is a guy that led the NFL in yards per reception this year and absolutely dominated any time he got the ball. And that's Brandon Ayuk. Um, I want pieces of this offense. Again, it's pretty simple. I, when I'm in a fantasy draft, if I had taken Justin Jefferson at the one four, I get back to this pick and I'm like, what offenses do I want to invest in? And who do I know is an absolute baller? And that's Brandon Ayuk. So I'm going to roll with him at the two nine. Not much else to be said. He pretty much led the NFL in yards per run, except for behind, I think, Tyreek Hill only. And the guy led the NFL in yards per reception. I seen uh, somebody tweeted it out. It was like um, the top seven receivers in in uh, fantasy or in um, uh, yards. Uh, receiving yards this year was like, you know, CeeDee Lamb and Tyreek Hill and Amara St. Brown, all these guys. Brandon Ayuk has 101 targets on the year. And he's up there with these guys who have 101 receptions or more on the season. This guy barely has the target share of like a wide receiver three right now. And he's producing at that level. Maybe you look at that and you're like, oh, he's going to regress and he might have like whatever. But I'm all I'm saying is like the older Brock Purdy gets, the more experience he gets in this offense, the more trust he's going to have to throw the yeah. ball. And if Brandon Ayuk stays in San Francisco, which is also a concern of this pick, then he's going to have all the opportunity in the world to continue growing with Brock Purdy and continue making those big plays happen. And the targets will come. Usually when a guy is leading the NFL in yards per run and yards per reception, he ain't getting less targets the next year than he got the year uh, before. Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty simple. He was extremely efficient. And, you know, the regression nerds are going to come out and say, well, this guy's going to regress to the mean. Like he's going to be closer to what he was two years ago. I don't care. 
I, I, I really don't care. One, over 1,300 receiving yards on 101 targets is ludicrous. And I think it's sustainable, man. This offense is the most efficient in the NFL for a reason. Brock Purdy's been the most efficient quarterback in that scheme for a reason. Kyle Shanahan knows what the hell he's doing, man. And I want to trust a receiver attached to a Kyle Shanahan level scheme. So I completely agree with Brandon Ayuk. Big play upside. Only seven touchdowns this year, too. Like that could easily go up as well, man. Like, I want pieces of it. And speaking of pieces of this offense, I'm just going to take his teammate right after you, man. Brandon Ayuk goes there. I'm taking Debo Samuel. And obviously, this was a guy that was much maligned entering last year, banged up two years ago. People didn't really know, oh, are the targets going to be there in this offense? Is Brock Purdy going to turn into a pumpkin? We got our answer. This is the best offense in the NFL for a reason. And since week 10, Debo Samuel on 24% of the targets has averaged over 20 PPR points per game with some big blowout gains in that stretch. You're obviously getting the targets that he's going to earn be extremely efficient on, but you're also getting the factor that when they're inside the 10, when they're inside the five, he's getting design touches. He's getting end arounds. He's getting rushing attempts to be able to score some rushing touchdowns. So you really, you're getting this do it all Jack of all trades type of playmaker. I don't think he can, he can leave the first two rounds of your fantasy drafts going into next year. Obviously some concern based off what happened two years ago, but Assuming Brock Purdy's back fully healthy, assuming, you know, Kyle Shanahan's still there, assuming Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle's taking pressure, Christian McCaffrey's taking pressure off, you don't need this guy to be a 30% tar uh, percent target share player to average 20 PPR points per game like he showed since week 10 this year. Yeah, dude, there's there's so many guys that you could put in this spot, and Debo, again, is one of those guys you're just swinging for a ceiling with. Like, dude, we're only doing two rounds of this, but I could take any one of the following names with this pick. I could take Chris Olave. I could take... James Cook. I could take Keenan Allen, who's been Michael who is Pittman. unbelievable uh, to start the season. I could take either of the Texans receivers, Tank Dell or Nico Collins. I could get Gutty and take Marvin Harrison Jr. We don't even know where he's going yet. Yep. I could go with Rasheed Rice, who really came on down the stretch of the season. The direction I think I'm going to go Michael with this Pittman. pick is I think I'm going to roll with Tank Dell. I'm going to go with Tank Dell. I'm going to go with a guy that I think has the upside to potentially win you a league. We see, We saw what he did this past year. Um, anytime he was on the field, when a rookie wide receiver shows that level of dominance, dominance from a target share standpoint, and his rookie quarterback has the chance to really become an MVP front runner next year. Uh, you want pieces of that offense as well. So again, I could have gone in a million different directions with this. We're only going two rounds. I'm sure somebody's going to comment. How the hell could you not have Keenan Allen this high? How the hell could you not have X player? I'm going to go with Tank Dell at this, at this current point in time. If nothing changes with CJ Stroud, Tank Dell and Nico Collins, either one of the Texans receivers deserves to be at least mentioned in the second round conversation. Yeah, and I don't think this is outrageous at all because in the games he played over 60% of the snaps this year, you're looking at only 60%. Assuming he's a full-time player back fully healthy next year, you're going to be looking at a guy who's getting 80, 90 plus percent of the snaps like he was when he was uh, healthy down the stretch. But in the games he played over 60% of the snaps, 20.2 PPR points, 25.5 PPR points, 3.9 downgrade that game, whatever. Then we get after the bye week. 6.1, 29.6, 18.9, 28.9, 17.2. You're getting potentially top 10 or easily top 10 quarterback play, but potentially even top five quarterback play with CJ Stroud. You're getting that second year bump. You're getting that connection that they developed. Again, this was a third round rookie receiver that stepped onto the scene and was basically averaging 70 yards per game. Like he was phenomenal. And I do think you can make the case between him and Nico Collins. Nico Collins, obviously that bigger, you know, bodied, touchdown threat T Higgins type of mold. But like you said, from an upside standpoint, I think you got to favor tank Dell based off what he was doing when he was healthy. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can, you could definitely make the argument tank Dell belongs to be up here again. I, there's a million guys I could have named Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs, Devon a Chan, uh, Mike Evans, who's having a monster year. Um, maybe you want to venture into the tight end range and you want to go with a Sam Laporta or a Mark Andrews or whatever kind of guy you could go after whoever quarterback three would be for you. Probably Lamar Jackson or somebody like that has a, a real conversation in being in this area. Who are you rolling with? Who's the last guy of this draft? Yeah. And I think this is the hardest pick for me. Cause like you said, you can be between a bunch of guys here, whether it's Mike Evans, whether it's Keenan Allen, whether it's, you know, the guy uh, I might take here with Michael Pittman, Jalen Waddle, Devonte Smith, Chris Olave, Nico Collins. Like there are so many names you could put in the spot. And honestly, if I knew where Marvin Harrison was as of today, Marvin Harrison Jr. would probably have been the pick, but for simplicity's sake, don't want to get into the rookies right now since we don't know the landing spots. Might confuse some people. 
I'm going to go with Michael Pittman Jr. Now, we saw the level of target dominance he was able to set this year. 150 targets in the 15 games he played. That includes the game that he left early with that concussion uh, just a few weeks back. But you're looking at target counts that are absolutely phenomenal. 11 targets, 12 targets, 11 targets, 14 targets, 13 targets, 8 targets, 12 targets, 13, 16, 11. Like, this guy, when he is healthy and when he's on the field, you can almost book in for a 10-target game. That's how consistent he was down the stretch. Now, is he going to be the guy that blows you away from a yards per catch standpoint? Is he going to be the guy that blows you away and has 15 receiving touchdowns? Not necessarily, but I do think four receiving touchdowns, I think that's going to improve Anthony Richardson coming back fully healthy. Obviously, he's a rushing threat, but he's got a passing ceiling in his own right. Big, deep bomb uh, level quarterback that can really stretch that third level of the field. While Michael Pittman's kind of viewed as this possession guy, he is a three-level threat. He can win down the field. We've seen contesting catches down the stretch uh, last year, the year before. Like, we've seen this guy be a factor down the field. It's just given the context of the offense with Gardner Minshew, he was playing a lot around the line of scrimmage. I do think that we see that three-level nature recapture with Anthony Richardson at the helm. And I do think that while Michael Pittman may not get the raw targets that he saw last year with Gardner Minshew, being how much he checked it down, I do think the value of those targets with Anthony Richardson are going to increase. Yeah, I would I would probably put Pittman more in the mid to th- mid to late third area, just yeah. given that a lot of the damage he did was with Gardner Minshew, and we don't know what the passing ceiling in terms of volume and stuff would be, which is why I think of the Colts players, I think Taylor is the one that I gravitate towards more in the early range of the draft next year, at least as it currently stands. I definitely would have gone with Keenan Allen over uh, Michael Pittman. Definitely I definitely fair. would have gone with uh, Rasheed Rice, even over uh, Michael Pittman or uh, Mike Evans over Michael Pittman or, you know, some of those running backs I mentioned. If we, like, I I really do think that Josh Jacobs is going to be back with the Raiders. I think Pierce, if he gets the job, is going to want him back. I think that Saquon, you know, he's going to be back with the Giants. I don't know if Daniel Jones is going to be the quarterback or whatever, but there's a number of guys that I would have went with over Michael Pittman, but I I don't blame you for going with him there. Chris Olave also probably would have went with over him. You mentioned Tank Dell, even Nico Collins is in consideration. That kind of shows me more so that, This tier is so wide. I honestly think like between Michael Pittman and like you said, you mentioned him mid to late third. I think the difference between those guys, Chris Olave, him, um, like looking through some of the names, Nico Collins, Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, uh, even like Amari Cooper. um, Devontae Adams, DK Metcalf even potentially. Yeah, like like, I really truly think this year, if we're looking at the uh, how the fantasy drafts are kind of made up, like we kind of mentioned last year, I kind of like the tail end of the drafts this year, man. Getting to pair an elite running back with an elite wide receiver, still having a relatively flat tier at that 3-4 turn that's comparable to the 2-3 turn, man. I'm liking the the sounds of that 11 pick, that 10 pick area. Yeah, and we didn't even mention onesies. Like if you're at that 1-2 turn, let's say you pair up Kyron Williams and Garrett Wilson or A.J. Brown and Jonathan Taylor or whatever, yeah. and you come back around at the 3-4 turn and you got Lamar Jackson and Mark Andrews on the board still, like yeah. which is definitely going to be possible. You That's something that I would be very much a fan of. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. But uh, either way, that was the first two rounds of the mock draft. If you guys enjoyed, make sure you leave a like down below. Comment your biggest, you know, gripe with the mock draft. Would you have not taken Michael Pittman? Did you think uh, Travis Etienne was too high? Like, whatever you think uh, you would have done differently, feel free to leave in the comment section. We love engaging with you guys. We love talking strategy. Again, this is literally right off the back of week 17. We're going fresh off of what we know right now. Obviously, with a offseason of research, with looking more into the numbers, you're going to get a better final product going into August. But we're having some fun. Yeah, absolutely. A lot's going to change. But uh, if you did enjoy, leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel if you guys are new around here. Um, Flock Fantasy, we got all the content you guys will need for this offseason, whether it's Dynasty, whether it's Rookies, whether it's a bonus uh, weekly episode every single week. This week, we're going to be tackling our pass catchers 6-10, to 10, way too early 2024 NFL draft rankings. So we'll be talking about Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell and um, you know, all the guys that you guys want to know about for your fantasy football rookie drafts, you can go over to flock fantasy right now and use promo code FSE to get a seven day free trial. After that seven day free trial is up 30% off any of the packages. If you sign up annually, you can get a zoom consultation with one of us. So if you're like, okay, season just ended, I got five dynasty leagues or whatever, and I need to reset my strategy for these leagues. Zoom consultation is the best way to do it. Dynasty decisions priority, of course, is a part of using our code as well. But that Zoom consultation will be infinitely more valuable because you can ask us direct questions. You can look at some of the teams in your league and we can be like, hey, go target that guy. It looks like his team is kind of stuck in the weeds or whatever. Definitely a valuable resource. So hopefully you guys stuck around all the way to the end, a bit of a longer video, but a fun one nonetheless. So appreciate you guys for tuning in. Peace out. We'll talk to you soon.